When I was young, I was like most children, as I would come into the house often telling my grandmother or asking her, uh, I'm, what, what's there to drink? I'm thirsty. And my grandmother would say, like maybe some of your grandmothers or mothers or fathers would say, uh, get some water. <laughs> get some water. And so when my grandmother would tell me, get some water, I would be like, uh, I'm not having that. No, I'm good. I'm going to go back, back outside and play. Uh, I'm cool. I'm not drinking no water. You know, and, and, and water to me was, le- that, that, that wasn't something that I considered as something to drink or to satisfy my thirst. And so I would often be looking for Kool-Aid and things like that, working to get some punch or whatever at the store at the village pantry, dating myself to get over there to get the drink that I wanted. But often, as I said, my grandmother would say, get some water. And when I would say I didn't want, that, want none of that, my grandmother would say, well, then you ain't thirsty. You, 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 you're not thirsty. You don't, you don't want what's on deck because if you were thirsty, you would take what was available. Mm. But you know what's interesting is that my dislike for water wasn't always a dislike for water. There was a time that I would want water and water would be the only thing that I would take. And it was that time when I was playing basketball, when I'm uh, parched and perspiring, when I'm thirsty and sweating, uh, cold water would be the only thing that I could take. The only thing that would quench my thirst, that would give me energy, that would put the electrolytes back in to help me continue playing the game. Saints, from that backdrop, for a few moments, I'd like to preach for subject of theme, thirst quenching testimony. The thirst quenching testimony. The thirst quenching testimony. Like the cold water I drank after playing ball, our testimony is meant to be that quencher for others who are living lives that need refreshment because they're all dried out and parched because of the struggles, the troubles, the trials, and the tribulations that they're facing right now. Uh, they're, they're down and out. And so your witness, my witness, my story uh, is Christ on display to give them hope in a time where they seem to be hopeless. Mm. What's interesting is some of you know that uh, me and my wife are renewing our vows next week. And as we uh, set up our wedding website, we I saw looking on the page that there was an opportunity for me to share our story, for us to share our story. And so we were supposed to tell our story and uh, about how we met and how our romance has grown and how we got to the point of wanting to get to the wedding. Not only were we able to tell our story, to write it, but we could also add pictures of time past and time present to indicate or illustrate just what this relationship is. The whole point of the story, the words and the deeds, the the discussion and the pictures is really about attracting people that we've invited to come to the ceremony. In the same way, our testimony with Christ, our actions, our conversation and our deeds are meant to work together to be an added attraction to make people to want to come to the coming attraction that is Christ to satisfy the thirst, the longingness in their lives. A thirst-quenching testimony. Last week, we focused on the testimony that will provide a platform for us, that, that testimony must determine the manner of our movement. Remember, we focused on three specific verses. Verse, 13, verse 10, we focused on where it says that after his brothers had left, Remember verse 10, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast. And what we understood that uh, our movement must be a movement, a movement from opposition. That our testimony to get to the platform that God has for us must begin with a movement from opposition. It was after his brothers had said that he should go to this feast for a different reason than the reason that God had him go. Remember it was your time versus our time. Mm. Jesus said, I'm on my time, you on your time. Uh, his time, God's time, his godly worldview versus their worldly worldview. Uh, him being directed and surrendered to God, operating to be a testimony, a witness for God versus them being 100% ready to do whatever they wanted, to go wherever they wanted, to go when they wanted, to get what they wanted, however they had to go about getting it. He said, my time has not yet come. And so after they went to the feast, he said, you on and go. I'm not going. And then after that, he decided to go. 
He was moving from the opposition, the misunderstanding of his purpose. And sometimes in order for God to use you, in order to God to get you to the platform, to put you on the stage for you to see the cast and the characters that God has set for you to be the, the provision of the, the witness that he wants you to be, you got to move away from the troubling situations that are in your lives. And sometimes the troubling situations that are in your lives are not just the people that are on deck. Sometimes it's the thing that's going on inside of you that's creating the most trouble and trauma in your life. You got to move from the opposition, but not only do that move from the opposition, remember verse 4, as it says, uh, 14, it says, about the middle of the feast. You see, see, not only did he move from the opposition, but you also, you got to have move with purposeful exposure. Move with purposeful exposure. Look at verse 14, what it says, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. Here's the purpose. He was going to the feast, not just to show up, remember, he was going to teach. He was going to give some instructions. Mm. But it says that he moved privately, not public. Remember, the, there were people at the feast that were seeking to kill Jesus. So Jesus at that time couldn't just go out there and show himself to the world. He had to go privately. See, he had to go with some thoughtful thinking about how he was going to move. You can, sometimes you got to move under the cloak of night. You got to, you, God is doing his greatest work a lot of times when there are no eyes on you, but the only eyes that see what he's doing is you and God and the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. You're not always going to shine out front. Sometimes you got to move privately, even though it seems like the ones that's doing public are getting further than you getting. It seems like they're on top. It seems like things are going their way. It seems like they're walking in deliverance while you're walking in destruction. See, you, you, you can't trip when God is walking you and preparing you and developing you behind the scenes. Uh, his development behind the scenes will get you to the stage. There are some times in life where God is doing his greatest work in the dark. They said that uh, the darkest point of night is just before dawn, and I ain't talking about dawn. It, it, it's just before dawn. Is just before the light of day. He moves privately. And then it says also at the middle of the feast. But why the middle of the feast? Because remember, it not only was about the, the development, but it also was about safety. Because they were expecting him, the Jews and the Pharisees that were seeking to destroy him, to take him out. The people that were putting his mouth on his testimony, his development, on his witness, they were waiting right there expecting him to come out at the beginning. What am I saying? There's some times where people are looking at you and think you're done and burnt and, and you're not going to be developed. You're not going to prosper. They've counted you out not knowing that in the darkness in the private time God has counted you in G G God is seeking to heal you when it hurts the most he he he's seeking to bring you out when it seems like you're going deep and under uh, see they, they are they're waiting and putting their mouth on you but because they don't see what God is doing in the dark they're speaking doubt and despair while God is speaking hope and healing now, at the middle of the feast, see, see, there's a time where God has to let people play out. They got to say things about you. They got to depart from you. They got to they got to not help you. See, God has to let these people walk away uh, in times when nothing's going to happen so he can develop the ones that's going to be on deck when you hit the stage. They could have had VIP, but they got to buy a ticket now. What does that mean? They didn't want to walk with you when you was nobody. They didn't want to be here when there was nobody here. But when they come, when everybody comes, the position that they could have had, they will no longer have. They will no longer have. They could have been VIP, but they don't have to buy a ticket when you hit the stage. When everybody comes, they ain't going to be as close as they could have been. Moving in privately, meaning that there's a time where you will go public because notice it says Jesus starts teaching. Jesus starts walking in the purpose for what God has for him to do. Are you in your purpose season? Has God put you in front of people right now for you to really start doing what God wants you to do? Oh, I got to remember now. Remember, Jesus understood that God is able to use purpose both in happy times 
and hurt times. Uh, sometimes God will reveal himself and what he's doing in your life when there's that celebration moment when everybody's around, when everything's peachy cream. But, but, but Jesus understood that also God is able to bring out his call on your life when the times where it seems at his darkest hour. He, Jesus started preaching when John the Baptist was up there said to be beheaded and it only opened up the door for God to start using Jesus to preach to the world to reveal that he's the son of God in the flesh. Jesus understood that his public testimony sometimes comes out of the darkness. It's like uh, Batman, the dark night rising. Uh, they thought he was done for, uh, but, but the dark night rose up. See, it, God has a way to take your darkness and use it as a rising point to develop what you've been meant to be. Arriving at verse 37, we'll see this thirst-quenching testimony uh, on display. Look at what verse 37 says. It says that on the last day uh, of the feast, this great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, uh, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water, not stale water, not creek water, not set pump water. He said rivers of living water. See the phrase right there, on the last day of the feast, and the phrase the great day helps us to see this time element. That this last day is significant, that Jesus, that God has a way of working the greatest thing out on the last day. The last day. A lot of times when you get to the last day, you think it's over. Even with the Black Expo, when you look at it on that Sunday, that final Sunday, it's the day where you see the least amount of people there. It's the day where they're not talking about the, the, uh, the free concert or the concert that came that you had to pay for. Nobody's talking or celebrating the, bl the Black Expo then. But I don't know if you know, if you've been like me and you went on the last day, sometimes on that last day is when you get the best deal. Mm. On that last day is when the prices come down. Uh, the, the one that they were uh, selling you on the 17th of July, uh, all of a sudden on the 21st or so in the, the last part of the week, uh, all of a sudden it ain't the same price no more. It's the same merchandise but not the same price, meaning that you end up getting what everybody paid more for for less. You get high quality for low, time, for low dollar. Uh, the last day, uh, the most significant day. Look at that great day. That great day means that it's the most significant, the most important day of all the, all the days of the feast. Now that feast, I got to help you right here. That feast was an eight-day feast. Mm. So for seven days, they were celebrating. But it says that Jesus, God moved it, that Jesus would come on this last day, on day number eight. I don't know if you know it or not, but in the Bible, the, the word seven means the number of completion, but the word eight signifies a new beginning. Jesus is coming on the eighth day for a new beginning. Has God taken your darkness and brought your darkness into the public light for to give you a new day? Is God using the despair as a doorway to your new day? Is your despair a doorway to your new day? Is your despair, is your darkness development season for your deliverance? Uh, that, that, that's what God is doing. Jesus shows up on the eighth day. What does it mean that all other days, all seven days prior, was just dress rehearsal? Yes. It was just dress rehearsal for the ceremony. Why, you ask? I hear you talking, Gene. You got me all emotional and, and shaken up and shook up. Look, show me what, what you mean when you say this last day. Well, 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 well uh, the eighth day was a day of solemn reflection and prayer. Uh, this is where they were sitting down reflecting on what God had done, what they had went to God for in praise and celebration. And in this celebration on this day where everybody's seated, where it's quiet, all attention up front, Jesus stands up. He said Jesus stood up so that he would be seen. Now that picture that, that's Jesus getting up. So that he can be heard in a time where there's supposed to be prayer and quiet time reflection. They were meditating and thinking about who God was and what God was doing. And our house sometimes you'll catch, depending on which one of us praying, one of us will walk in the room and say something to the other and there'll be no real response and the other person say, I'm praying. 
uh, Gene, I'm praying. And so what that means is that your talking right now is a disturbance to my communication with God. Jesus stood up to be a disturbance to what they were saying was communication with God. Not only did he stand up to be seen, because it wasn't just that he was standing up, getting his tuna together, fixing up his uh, pants and things like that to make his way through the crowd to the restroom uh, or the outhouse or whatever is in their context. No, he wasn't just moving about to go get straight. He also stood up and it says he cried out. That word cried out means he screamed. And, and he screamed during prayer. Now, now, what does that mean he screamed? It meant that he was trying to get their attention. He didn't just want to be seen, but he wanted to be heard. What am I saying? That there are some situations and some circumstances that are in your life right now where God is standing up and he's screaming to get your attention so you put your focus on him. What is that thing right now that you're thinking about, that you've been experiencing, that you can't can, can shake off your mind, that has got your attention, and God has called something to happen for him to get you to look away from what you're looking at and to look towards him? Jesus stood up not just to be seen, but also to be heard. It, it, somewhat like uh, uh, February the... 13th, 1996, uh, when Tupac got out of jail, and, and Tupac put out this double platinum, this double CD album in the rap game. It hadn't been done before. But check out what the title of the, the thing was, All Eyes on Me, All Eyes on Me. See, Jesus stood up and said, All Eyes on Me. Here, you, you thought I was knocked out. Pac was coming out of jail. They, they had just been shot and locked up and falsely accused for rape. Everybody in the game thought he was done, so he puts out a double CD album that goes platinum, probably double platinum and to let everybody know that I know you all looking at me to see what's going to go up. Well, this ain't Pac right here, but 2,000 years ago, prior to 1996, Jesus stood up and said, all eyes on me. All eyes on me. He cried out. I need you to look at me. And why did he want him to look at me? Why did Jesus go public? Why did Jesus go public when they was trying to kill him? Did, 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 did all of a sudden, did the people change their mind? Has life changed his mind on trying to take you out? Are the people that's been talking about you, have they stopped talking about you? Are the people that are abandoning you, have they stopped abandoning you? Are the people that's criticizing and trying to crucify you uh, while you're going through what you're going through, have they stopped doing that? No, they didn't stop doing that. No, they hadn't stopped doing what they were doing with Jesus. They still were on the scene wanting to take Jesus out. But God, through the power of his spirit, put Jesus on deck to stand up, to be seen and heard. Real men are seen and heard. Uh, he says, if anyone, he says, why did he go public? Now, the answer is not the fact that he screamed. It's in what he screamed. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts. Let me do it. If anyone thirst, that word anyone is an indefinite pronoun. Thank you that you did grammar, uh, the preacher. The, 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 what he's saying is that, that it's not specific. It, it, it's, it's not isolative. It, it's not uh, this, this clickish type thing. He's not saying only you or only you. He says all of y'all, any one of you, if you thirst, come to me and drink. He said, then whoever, anyone, whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, as God has said before I got here, uh, in the scriptures, out of his heart, that word heart means life, out of his life will flow living, living water. Uh, living water. Look at the word thirst. Break, make it plain, Gene. Thirst. It says to have a desire for liquid or to be thirsty. It's to suffer thirst, to have a strong desire, a longing to accomplish a goal or to obtain something something. See, Jesus right here is being figurative. What, what is really illustrating to us is in our context, you know, years ago, a few years ago, uh, one of the things we would say to people, say, oh, he's thirsty. <laughs> she thirsty. Uh, meaning that they were desperate and eager to attain something, and most of the time it had to do with sex. Uh, he, she's thirsty. She, she, she's putting up all her effort, and everybody can see that, that he or she is only focused on one thing. Jesus is speaking figuratively, uh, speaking on the earth, uh, earthly, to, uh, on the earth realm to reveal heavenly matters. Jesus speaks in two realms. He's speaking about earthly situations to reveal heavenly matters. Natural circumstances to indicate a spiritual reality. Natural circumstances to reveal a spiritual reality. Jesus, when he came to earth, was the son of God coming out of the spiritual to come to the physical realm of earth to reveal a heavenly matter. 
Uh, Jesus still speaks to us in our life that there are situations that's going on in our lives. There are troubles, trials, and tribulations, hurts, harms, and hang-ups that's got us hooked up uh, that God is speaking through to reveal his spiritual situation, the reality, the, the deliverance, the point of the situation to get our attention on him. Jesus uh, first refers to the natural or life's longing, the solution or deliverance that we're going after. It's that problem that threatens to destroy us that is on our mind every day, all day. Jesus says that God said, I'm speaking to you in the midst of this thing that you're longing to be over with. Mm. This thing that you, you want to change, I'm in the midst of it. And, uh, and so he uses an object lesson. Now here it is. This is what God on the last day revealed to me as I was late getting up and getting here this morning, walking to my car on the last day of me preaching in this text for this, this sermon series. Uh, all the other time he hadn't showed me this. This is what he showed me. Jesus uses an object lesson. He's playing on the feast ceremony. Why do you ask? Remember we said years ago, said that when this Feast of t uh, Tabernacles was about them coming through the wilderness, that they were going to celebrate, to, to celebrate God bringing through their 40-year disobedience and keeping them covered, didn't let their shoes and shirt wear out. Has God ever kept you in the wilderness? Has that God ever covered you? Some things that should have took you out, didn't wear you out, uh, but God still brought you out. They, they were supposed to be celebrating God's faithfulness. But 200 years prior to Jesus' uh, time, the Pharisees, the preachers on deck, uh, the church leaders at that time, the deacons and the usher board, they changed what the feast was about and they added what they call water rituals. Water rituals, water rituals. They would go to the uh, Pool of Siloam, a popular uh, pool there, and they would draw water, and for seven days, they would bring the water back in gold, shiny pictures, so everybody's attention would be on the pictures, and they would walk in the temple, and they would uh, sacrifice the water a celebration for God bringing water for their harvest. What am I saying? During the summertime, it would be dry season and there would be no water for their crops, meaning that they wouldn't be able to grow the food and the wealth that they needed to survive. They also wouldn't have drinking water to deal with their daily thirst. Jesus uses their change of the ceremony. Uh, they changed the ceremony from a worship situation to focus on God, to a sermon, a situation to focus on getting their needs. Hmm. So instead of them going to church, getting in the Word, going in prayer to celebrate God and what Christ has done on the cross, they start talking to God about their health, their marriage, their children, their business, their work, their car, their dream. They're looking good, their wedding, their marriage. Uh, not that these things aren't good, but what happened is they added on some good stuff to God's stuff. They were no longer celebrating God for who he was. They were celebrating God for what they can get. And if you look back, this is why Jesus tells the brothers that they're worldly. When they said, go to the feast, Jesus said, they ain't focused on me or my father. They're focused on what they can get. They're not focused on the gift giver. They're focused on what they can get out of the giver. Yeah. Mm. The feast two, century, two centuries prior had changed what church was about. Have you ever changed what church and worship was about? Yeah. Have you ever made worship and church about what's bothering you and, 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 and lost sight of the one who's brought you to healing, who can get you to what you're meant to be, the one that put his son on the cross to die for you, to die for your sin, who was crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected, that you might be brought to the Father who yet now lives, who is praying for you in the midst of your darkness and your despair, even though you continue to walk away from him, continue to put things, people, places, and desires above him, who is still in the Spirit, interceding on your behalf, that you might be made whole, that you might experience the things that you need, even though he hasn't always given you what you want. Jesus waits to this last day of the sermon series about timing and testimony to use this time to say that that thing that you are worried about getting, he said that I am the one that you shall be longing for. This is why he says that you, if you come to me 
and drink. See, uh, see, they did this seven days a week. The first six days, they would walk around and carry the water. But on the seventh day, they would do it seven times. What's that sound like, you ask? That sounds like the Jordan coming out of the Jordan to get to Jericho, to defeat Jericho. What am I saying? We got to be careful because Satan tricks us and to take spiritual deliverances to put our worldly things in those things to make it look like we're doing God's work when we're really doing world work. What am I saying? when they were trying to conquer Jericho, they were walking around one time for six days. But on the seventh day, they were celebrating and praising God, walking around Jericho. And on the seventh day, God made Jericho fall. God said that if you're going to do godly things, you need to do godly things for godly reasons. Seek ye first his kingdom, seek his authority, seek his presence, seek loving God for who God is. And out of loving God for who he is, God will give you what you need. He said, but if you keep trying to get what you need and then hoping you're going to get back to who God is, it ain't going to work that way. You're going to end up not having what you got and end up not seeing the one you're looking for. You're going to end up losing what you have right now, and then you can't find the one that was already available while you was caught up trying to get the come up. You're going to lose the one that you were caught up while you was trying to get the come up. You, he ain't going to be there no more on the last day. See, they had a worship change. They were giving their praise and celebration to the come up. That when you do this, God, when you do that, God, and when you make me this, God, and when you deliver here, God, when you heal here, God, when you restore there, God, when you bless here, God, then I'll worship you. Then I'll see you for who you are. God said, you ain't seen me for who I am yet, and I've given you all that you need, all that you have, actually, and you still haven't seen me for who I am. So Jesus stands up and said, you've been thirsting for the wrong things. He says, whoever, anyone, that thirst. And are you longing for something? Have you chased something? Is that something you need done right now? Because I, want, I don't want to talk to you about this if you're not one that's been thirsty. If, if you're not one that's been sitting in a situation where you need some things done, some things change. Because maybe God's not talking to you. Maybe you, you can get right. Uh, maybe, maybe you got it right. Maybe you've never been in need. Maybe you've always had a supply. Maybe you've always worked it out. And if that's who you are, then God is not talking to you. And you can go ahead and put your fingers in your ears right now. Jesus waits to the last day to use this thirst-quenching testimony to reveal that this ceremony, that this church experience has not been what it's been about. They have not been seeking him for who he is. And therefore, the thing that would give them peace in the midst of the storm they have not received. He says, I'm the only one that provides for your longing. He's basically saying, you should be thirsty for me. You should be desperate out there like that man or that woman out there trying to get that sex, that all of their conversation, all their action, all their gifts, everything they do, what they put on to get that attention, you need to be out there doing that for me. You need to be putting all your effort up for me. Not trying to prove them wrong and prove yourself right to prove they were wrong for abandoning you and not helping like you need help. No, 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 you need to put that up for me because I'm the one that satisfies you. I'm your deliverer. I'm the gift that never dies out. What are you thirsty for? What, 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 what is God using this situation that's going on in your life right now to reveal what you're thirsty for. See, he's not saying they're not thirsty. He said that you're thirsty, but you're thirsty for the wrong thing. Here's the attraction, the, imita the invitation additive to what we do as witnesses for God. That word thirst was meant to be a recognition for them to understand that they were longing for the wrong things. And then out of that, he uses the word come as an invitation to come to him. He says come, the word come means to move toward, not just move out, move away from what you've been going after and move towards me. He says, but a lot of us, we come to church, we come to God. 
we pray and we talk to God. But he uses that conjunction right there, and to say that there's another part to this. It's part A and part B, plan one, plan two. He says that not only do you move towards me, he says, but you need to drink. Remember, he says drink means to accept, receive the provision that is there. Receive Christ for who he is. If you start recognizing and getting closer to how do I receive, that means how do you drink? Drinking means you start praying and fellowshipping and not just talking to him about what you can get, where you can go, or what he can bring. Not just what you can get, where you can go, or what he can bring. He said, talk to him for who he is. God, help me understand who you are. Uh, because if I know who you are, then I already understand that out of your presence, I can get the presence, plural. Out of your presence, singular, I can get the presence, plural. Uh, if, 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 if I understand you as the gift giver, I know you give gifts. Because you can't be a gift giver without giving gifts. But, but I want to start with the getting the gifts. He said, I need to start looking at this church thing, this prayer thing, this worship thing, this hallelujah thing, this grateful thing, this thanksgiving thing, to see who you are. I need to look at the cross to realize that you first was trying to deal with my sin because my sin is the barrier to me getting close to you. It's the things that I'm thirsting for that I'm putting before you, the cart before the horse, if you will, that's getting me in the way of the horse. Do you know that if you put the cart before the horse, that means that the cart is pulling the horse? That means that the gifts that you want God to give you directing where Jesus goes, when Jesus comes, how long Jesus stays, how much Jesus is worth. And if the cart is pulling the horse, that means that the things that are on the cart that generally the cart carries falls off because it's going the wrong direction. That means that the things that you put your stock in, the things that you said, if this happens, I'll be whole. That thing that, thing that you think makes you the, the, the end all be all, that makes you celebrate it, makes you worth something or somebody that makes you broken but fixed. Uh, that thing will only be on the cart for so long because the bumps of life will cause it to fall off. And guess what? I don't know if you've ever seen the rodeo, but if you ever watch Big Valley, if you ever Barbara stands with Heath and them. Uh, if you ever watch that, horses tend to buck when you got to go the wrong way. If you move the range of the horse and it's going backwards, the horse is going to start kicking and going the wrong way. So Jesus, if you got him going the wrong way, the situations and the circumstances in your life right now might just be Jesus bucking as the horse while you trying to pull him with the carts of the things and the people and the places of what you want in life, trying to make him go a wrong way. If you are the cart pulling Jesus the wrong way, you are trying to pull Jesus towards the world and away from his father. You are trying to make him something that he was never meant to be and he's going to kick and buck and pull and shake and your life is going to be a living hell because you trying to make the horse follow the cart while you are on the other side of the cart playing the ring leader in this wrongful circus Jesus said you thirsting for the wrong thing so he said you've been coming to me but you won't drink See, you won't get closer to me. You won't serve me more. You won't serve others more. You, 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 won't keep, you won't talk to me about how you can help other people. You won't talk to me about who I am. You won't talk to me about this relationship that I've been trying to get for your whole 50 years of life. I've been trying to help you. Yes, you've been in churches in the past. Yes, you sat in the family, in the first family. But I've been trying to get your attention this whole time. But you've been thirsty for the wrong things. And you like the old commercial. When Jesus is gone, as he tells them in his text, in a little while you're going to look for me, but you won't find me. I'm going to go to a place where you ain't going to be able to find me. He said, you're going to mess around and say, I could have had a V8. See, you, it's that commercial where they drink something and they realize they could have had the real nutrients, this vegetable eight, V8. You could have had the healthy, the fulfilling things in life, but you went after everything else. And when it's all said and done, when you look for me and you can't find me, you say, I could have had Jesus on the eighth day. I could have had a V8. I could have had victory eight, V8. A new beginning. You could have had a new beginning but you kept 
turning this service about you carrying the water, asking God to only do what you need and not what others need, to only be what you want him to be and not being who he could be so you could be who you were supposed to be. Lastly, he says, flowing with living water. The living water is what he was telling them is this. For every feast of booth that they would have after that, he was telling them that he was the reason for that feast. Because remember, they added on looking for the water. He was saying that he's not only the one that would give you through the wilderness, but he's also the one that would give you the Holy Spirit, that would give you peace, that would be overflowing, that word heart, belly, from the inner parts of you through the rest of your life. Just like when you eat food, what you eat food has to digest so it helps out even your fingertips. He said that if you trust me, you ain't got to keep having these feasts. You don't got to keep coming to church playing these games for people and people and places and, and for perception. He said, you will actually be the one that is flowing with living water, that you will be a witness to your family and your friends and them that will make them see your story and want to come to the wedding that is Christ Jesus on the cross, resurrected high and lifted up that will come back and take you to the Father's house to be with him. Jesus says this. He says that I go to a place in John 14, 15, in that area, John 14, I go to a place to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. He said, and in my Father's house there are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. What he's really saying in their custom is that after they would get married, it was customary for the husband would leave the bride go prepare his father's house, add a room on, and then come back and bring the wife to live there. He's saying that I am the Feast of Tabernacles. He said that I, you're going to look for me, but you ain't going to find me. You're going to want to go to my father's house, but the chance is already up. You ain't got to keep coming during the ceremony. If you just come to me, we can be wedded. Jesus said, you can marry me. And then where I go, you'll be also. The thirst quenching testimony. Your life in Christ should begin with peace on how you respond to God. That's the testimony. And the time is now. It's your time, his time, God's time. And that it will cause others to be more attractive to want to be with the God that's in you than just you. Amen? Let's stand and pray.